University of Maine President Joan Farini Mundy, Secretary William Cohen, General Jim Mattis, and Medal of Honor recipient Lance Corporal Kyle Carpenter. Welcome to the 2022 Cohen Lecture at the University of Maine. Please stand for the posting of the colors by members of the University of Maine Army and Naval ROTC Color Guard and the National Anthem, sung by Crystal Ryder, a member of the Maine Army National Guard 195th Army Band. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming in the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does the star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Please be seated. Good morning. It is exciting and wonderful to see everyone in person for this outstanding event. Welcome and welcome back to the University of Maine. I would like to expend, extend a special welcome to our many distinguished guests and a thank you to our mi military community for your service. Thank you. The state's R1 Research University is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. Today, we are honored, honored to host three very dis distinguished guests who will deliver the 2022 Cohen Lecture, a particularly timely discussion of the importance of leadership in a dangerous world, now more than one month into, into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This year's lecture is the 13th in a series of presentations featuring nationally recognized speakers from the highest levels of government, the military, and the media. The Cohen Lecture, which is held every other year, presents for our consideration thoughtful insights from and dialogue among 
some of today's most remarkable intellects, key decision makers, and keen observers of national and international events. This lecture series exemplifies the importance of Secretary William Cohen's leadership and legacy that are part of the fabric of Maine's flagship university here in Orono. We are grateful for his lifelong example of leadership, which has been ethical, thoughtful, independent-minded, and above all else, civil. Upon retiring from public life, Secretary Cohen generously donated his papers chronicling his three decades of public service to the University of Maine. Today, the Cohen archives are housed in the state's largest library, UMaine's Fogler Library. In addition, Secretary Cohen lent his name and support to the William S. Cohen Institute for Leadership and Public Service, a center here at the University of Maine. I am very proud of the work of the Cohen Institute, which recognizes the importance of educating the leaders of tomorrow in a variety of disciplines. The Cohen Institute prepares students to address the challenges of a complex world and to make their own contributions to our state and beyond so that they can define tomorrow. Mr. Secretary, as we have noted before on this stage, thank you for what you and your team at the Cohen Group make possible for our students and for everyone associated with the Cohen Institute. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with you to offer outstanding opportunities in the true tradition of our state's land, sea, and space grant university. Now, please join me in welcoming our moderator for the Cohen Lecture, Felicia Knight, president of the Knight Canny Group. Good afternoon, everyone. By way of introducing our guests today, we're going to kind of depart a little bit from the general biography. Kyle Carpenter is many things. Kyle is a son, a brother, a husband, a Marine, a leader, a hero, and a survivor. He's a best-selling author, a sought-after speaker, an extreme sports enthusiast. He's also about to launch a major podcast, and he is the youngest living person to be awarded our country's highest and most prestigious military decoration, the Medal of Honor. Kyle's just 32, and he is the first person to tell you he does not want to be defined by any one experience in his life, in a lifetime of experiences, some of which haven't even happened yet. But to explain how he came to be here today, I have to tell you about one experience. In November of 2010, as a 21-year-old Marine, Kyle was posted on a rooftop in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. He was there with another Marine, his best friend, Nick. During this watch, they were targeted by bullets, bombs, and grenades. And a live grenade was lobbed into their position, and without hesitation, Kyle threw himself on the grenade, saving the life of his friend. What followed for Kyle was more than most of us could imagine. His injuries were devastating. He was unconscious for five weeks. He flatlined three times and was in hospitals and care facilities for nearly three years, undergoing more than 40 surgeries to help reconstruct his face, his right arm, and other body parts torn apart by the explosion. There were days during his recovery period where just getting out of bed was a victory. Even in those darkest days of recovery, Kyle had a vision for his future. He'd run a marathon. He'd finish college. He'd backpack through Europe. He'd go skydiving. And he has done all of those things and many, many more, not the least of which getting married to his wife, Brittany, just last fall. Beyond his astonishing success in rebuilding his own life, Kyle has decided to use his platform to encourage others who are struggling and trying to overcome adversity. Kyle is a source of motivation and inspiration to everyone he meets and speaks to. Please welcome Kyle Carpenter.
Now, you might not expect a kid who hitchhiked around in the American Northwest or who thought nothing of hopping on a freight train to see what was out there, who by his own estimation was a mediocre student, or whose spirited behavior during his college years might have landed him in a local jail for a little visit, to then become someone with a library of 7,000 volumes, all of which he read, to become a four-star general in the United States Marine Corps, America's Secretary of Defense, and one of the most respected and sought after and admired leaders in our country. You might not expect it, but all those adventures are part of General Jim Mattis's story. <laughs> but now, according to General Mattis, that's exactly the kind of person who should be joining the military. Someone eager to explore, who's insatiably curious, with a yearning for knowledge and adventure and a desire to be part of a team. General Mattis' life has been defined by duty, loyalty, leadership, competence, caring, and conviction. And he has a personal motto by which he has lived his entire life, put others first. His study of world and military history is legend, as is his insistence that the men and women under his command be schooled in the cultural history of their deployment sites. As Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis gave up an enjoyable post-military life in his home state of Washington to once again serve his country, this time as Secretary of Defense. He did so with a great deal of grace under a great deal of pressure. And he did it with intelligence, independence, and integrity. Please welcome General Jim Mattis. <laughs> While it's accurate to say that Secretary William S. Cohen spent more than 30 years in politics, it's an inaccurate portrayal of his career. As President Farini Mundi mentioned, more than a life in politics, his is a life of public service. We all know about his rise in public office from city councilor to mayor to congressman to senator to secretary of defense. We know that he cast many votes and made many decisions that put his state his country, and his conscience before party or political expediency. His list of accomplishments on the world stage would take hours to list. Most we know about. Others were quietly achieved without fanfare. How and why did he become such a source for good? Well, maybe it's just me, but I believe it's because he's always been committed to the ideal of public service. The biggest reason I look forward to these events is because to be able to listen to Bill Cohen and his various guests through the years talk about national and international affairs, it's really a master class in how to appraise and approach difficult problems. Something we really don't get to observe that often in this age of instant outrage. Instead of jumping to conclusions, he listens. Instead of shouting down an opponent, he seeks common ground. Instead of issuing ultimatums, he asks questions. Instead of looking for that big win, he seeks mutually beneficial solutions. Bill Cohen is a humanitarian, he's a philosopher, a poet, and very much a leader. Yes, he understands politics, and he is a very deft politician. But as a public servant, his goal has always been to leave something better than he found it for the public. His deep understanding of the classics and the humanities give him a deep insight into the human condition and our needs for education, science, emotional and humanitarian needs. That's why he championed legislation to preserve civil and voting rights, to honor Martin Luther King Jr. and overhaul the US intelligence system. He also worked for the expansion of NATO, for women in combat, and against racism in the American armed forces. He has left public office, but he has not left public service. His presence today in this establishment, where he put the William S. Cohen Institute for Public Service here at the state's 
public research university are a testament to his desire to share his knowledge and wisdom and to give opportunities to a new generation of leaders. Maine, the nation, and the world are all better for having Bill Cohen in it. Please welcome Secretary William S. Cohen. Well, here we all are again. Last time we met, we discussed defense and diplomacy in an uncertain world. Well, in those few years, we've gone from uncertain to dangerous, and in so many ways. We have the dangers of mi microscopic viruses, the devastation of global warming, the debilitating politics that we are all enduring. We have our faltering relations and international relations with China, threats from North <coughs> Korea, and of course, the humanitarian crises unfolding in Ukraine and Yemen. So let's begin with Ukraine. Secretary Cohen, you get to go first. It's, <laughs> it's your house. <laughs> All right. Uh, Carla Del Ponte, the former chief prosecutor of the United Nations War Crimes Tribunals, has <clears throat> said that an arrest warrant should be issued for Russian President Vladimir Putin saying Putin <clears throat> is a war criminal. President Biden has accused him of being a war criminal, and in what we've seen coming out of Bucha in the last couple of days with sh civilians being shot and left for dead, is he a war criminal? I think absolutely. Uh, there's no question that uh, the leader of a country uh, the size of Russia, the Russian people, uh, for him to allow, if not direct, his military uh, to target uh, innocent civilians after promising, number one, I'm not going to invade Ukraine. I'm just conducting a routine <clears throat> training and exercise uh, maneuver. Uh, I will not attack civilian um, people, population, residential areas. And we've seen night after night, he has done exactly the opposite <clears throat> of what he pledged. Uh, I th it's no question in my mind, uh, he is a war criminal. He should be designated as such. And I hope that when people see President Putin's uh, face over the years that he may be in office, uh, they will see war criminal at least uh, visually embedded uh, <clears throat> on his forehead because that's what he is. I might say that um, perhaps I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me follow up with General Mattis then. The White House recently uh, released some information saying that President Putin was not being given correct information about the war, that his inner circle were too afraid to tell him the truth of how things are going. So then if he is ill-informed about what's really happening on the ground, who's in charge regarding these criminal acts? Who gets the blame for that? Well, the blame is clearly on Putin. Uh, he is the one who created a system <clears throat> where no one can bring forward a, uh, an opposing view. He's murdered or imprisoned his political opponents. He's murdered them even <clears throat> in, uh, in foreign countries using chemicals. Uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, he's clearly responsible for this. But I would point out that time is not on his side. Uh, he may be able to restrict the Russian people's ability to hear the truth. Uh, a Russian speaker in Kharkov or Kiev may have more freedom of speech than a Russian speaker in Moscow. But eventually, they're going to figure this out. The Russian people will. But uh, thanks right now to the democracy's holding firm, if we hold firm, he's going to lose this gamble and lose it big. And it's in no small part due to the American leadership. It's in no small part due to the Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg's just absolutely valiant leadership, and Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission's leadership, who had the sanctions ready to go, uh, crushing sanctions. So we're going to see this play out, but the responsibility for all the tragedy on the streets of Baku that you just m mentioned, and certainly for uh, everything that follows, is going to be on one man's head alone. I'm going to stick with you for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> when you say he's going to lose big, I worry, and I think a, a, a lot of people do, that in some respects, he's already won, because he's gone in, he's, he's created 
thousands of refugees. He has displaced millions of people. Mm -hmm. He has killed countless civilians. <clears throat> and then there are peace talks. And he's, he's not just going to leave. Mm -hmm. He's going to demand something. And if he gets whatever it is he demands in order for the, the violence to stop, yeah. hasn't he won? Uh, the short answer is no, but your, your question is valid. Uh, we're being reminded in a world where we thought we were beyond war, as some people put it, that, uh, that somehow soft power was going to reign. <clears throat> we're being reminded that hard power still matters. But break down who wins and who loses, break it down strategically, what he needed to do was weaken the European Union and shatter, fragment NATO. Mm -hmm. He has strengthened the European Union, and no doubt NATO is stronger than ever, and even countries like Finland and Sweden, not part of NATO, are for the first time in their history, including the Cold War, are considering joining. So on a strategic level, he's already jeopardized everything he set out for. On an operational level, he has shown the Russian army is pathetic. They do not have NCOs with the initiative and the aggressiveness of the American forces. And they're starting to look a bit like a paper tiger, a murderous paper tiger. They proved in the Middle East they were very adept at killing women and children and unarmed people and creating refugee flows. Well, they're now proving once again they can do that. But when they run up against someone who means business to fight them, like the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian soldiers, uh, we see a different outcome. No, he's lost already. It's just a matter of whether or not the West will stay together so nothing he's done is normalized. If we don't stick together, then he could have some, he could eke out some sort of a victory. We've seen a lack of patience historically <clears throat> in, in the United States even for war and for sticking together. Um, can NATO stick together? Secretary, I'll send, send this to you. Can, can NATO stick together? Can the European Union stick together? Because ultimately, this is about the Ukrainian people. Can we help them expel a Russian army? Well, that remains to be seen as to whether we can stick together. I think that uh, Putin uh, is planning um, that the United States will falter, that uh, he will survive the sanctions, and we, looking at our economic uh, interests, the economic pain that we will suffer as a result of higher prices, higher gas prices, higher inflation, uh, which is the war is contributing to, uh, that we will be anxious to remove them. In fact, he's already set that in motion. You know, what are the terms of any kind of peace agreement? Here's a man who has, as you pointed out, he has uh, affected the lives of 10 million Ukrainians. Uh, four million um, uh, refugees, uh, another six million people displaced, uh, <clears throat> creating um, uh, issues of uh, hunger, potential famine. Uh, and he has done this and now saying, possibly, we'll make peace when I decide it's time to make peace. And by the way, here are the pieces I want. Mm -hmm. I want Donbass, I want to keep Crimea, I may want to take uh, Odessa, uh, I may uh, go into Moldova. Uh, and. Um, and I will demand that or else. So I think it's really incumbent upon the United States to say, no, uh, we are going to stand firm uh, with our NATO members. We are going to reinforce our NATO uh, members. We are going to deploy more <coughs> troops and give more arms to the Ukrainians. How long we will do that, I don't know. Um, the question is, uh, he believes, again, that we will weaken uh, and uh, find some way to compensate him. I have publicly declared that Ukraine is the one that needs compensation. Yes. Ukraine needs reparations. We keep the sanctions on until every penny has been paid to reconstitute and rebuild the Ukrainian uh, country. Um, whether we will hold to that, the Europeans to date, and I, had, I met with one European um, official just this past uh, Friday, they are strong on this. They're <coughs> worried about the United States. They want to know if we will hold strong, not will they, they are committed because they're on the borderline. Uh, we're over here on the other side of the Atlantic, and they're saying, will you remain strong? And by the way, you've got elections coming up, and we're not too sure. Uh, we like what Biden has said, um, but we don't know how long he'll be there or whether the, uh, the political fortunes will be reversed, and you'll be back to talking about America first again and withdrawing support from the allies. We had a prior president who said he wanted to get out of Germany. 
who insulted the German Chancellor, Merkel, who said he wanted to pull our troops out of uh, Japan, South Korea, <clears throat> in addition to pulling them out of Syria and Afghanistan and potentially coming out of Iraq. So the message we have sent to the world is that we're retreating, we're withdrawing, we're coming back to America, meaning you're on your own. And when people say, look to themselves and say, you mean you're withdrawing your support and we're on our own? <clears throat> we may have to make a deal with the devil or the devils uh, in order to uh, ensure our prosperity and survival. So I, I think the, the challenge is really for the United States, I'm more confident than ever on the commitment on the part of the Europeans because they now understand what Putin has in mind. He wants to roll back all of the additions to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, NATO uh, since 1997. That means 15 countries out, and that brings us back to uh, the, the borderlands in 1997. And they know that. They don't want that. They want to know if we're going to be there to help them. Well, the, the two of you are giving excellent kind of 30,000 feet views. Kyle, I want to talk to you about what's happening on the ground. We have uh, different motivations here from both sides. The Ukrainian military and civilians are basically fighting for their lives, for their independence as a country. They're, they're motivated for saving themselves. We have Russian troops, many of them conscripts, who are not even sure of the mission. They were told initially, you're going on a training exercise. Oh, and now we're going to take you into Ukraine <clears throat> to denazify the country. So they're not really even sure what the mission is. So for soldiers on the ground, what are they thinking, both sides, in, in, the, in these combat situations? I believe that the Ukrainian troops are feeling and holding on to love. Love of their country, themselves, and their fellow troops, and ultimately love of democracy and the freedom and independence that they hold so dear, that we all hold so dear, and that, as we can see with every minute, comes at great cost and with great sacrifice. And as far as the Russian troops, I can only hope and pray that with time and every bullet fired that the troops along with their commanders begin to realize if they have not already that what they are being told does not align with what they are personally seeing on the ground. And as they push or retreat into these areas of Ukraine, um, it's not just troops. It's not one singular body. It's many troops, all with their own mind, and their own hearts. And uh, this is coming from the optimistic and hopeful side of me and my thinking, but um, I have seen throughout my recovery and my journey, and I've experienced power and the beauty of the human spirit and for our entire history that has ultimately prevailed and I just hope that the time that passes until that happens is much shorter than longer.
and um, it's uh, it's tough to believe that it's either tough to believe or it's unacceptable that President Putin does not understand fully what's going on. And there's, that's not an excuse. And that will never be an excuse. Because with great <clears throat> leaders who should ultimately make sure that uh, their intent is filtered to the very lowest level of troops out in the field. The privates that have been in the military for one week should know exactly what those at the very top expect and how they expect it. Um, so by saying that, if they are saying that, um, you're hurting yourselves even more in showing that uh, you ultimately cannot operate or communicate efficiently, which is a very fundamental and foundational element of a competent military. Let me ask, I'll put this to you and first to General Mattis. What are the consequences and what is it realistically possible for a commander or a soldier to refuse an order they know to be wrong or inhumane? Well, the Russian military does not have a uh, I would say an ethical framework. It's never evidenced one uh, at any time. <clears throat> so in the U.S. military, it's illegal to give an illegal order. You, you, it doesn't even have to be carried out. If you give the order, you are in violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice in U.S. law. And that's something the court martial will sort out. Uh, but if you carry out an illegal order, you are equally responsible. So there is no place to hide in the U.S. military from this sort of thing, and I believe that right now <clears throat> our wonderfully effective CIA, and under Bill Burns, uh, he has basically ambushed with his intelligence everything Putin was going to do starting last October, November, mm -hmm. and helping to set the conditions for all the NATO allies and other countries to come together here. If they continue at that level of penetration of the Russian operations, which there is no reason to think they will not, we will know the commanders' names of those units that were in certain cities. Uh, people can be held accountable for this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is it realistic in the heat of a battle for someone on, on the front line to say, no, I'm not going to do that? Well, Military necessity at times, I mean, war is one tragedy piled upon catastrophe, piled upon disaster. But at the point of contact, <clears throat> you, don't, you do things for military reasons. There's no military reason to shoot someone whose hands are tied behind his back. Mm -hmm. There's no military reason to attack a maternity hospital. Uh, th these are crimes against humanity, and we've been very clear, at least in the last hundred years, how we deal with crimes against humanity. Uh, whether or not we will see any kind of accountability inside the Russian forces, I don't know. Certainly history will hold them to account. And an increasingly isolated Russia, uh, paying a, a, an incredible economic price, diplomatically isolated. Uh, it's young people, I mean, 43% of its 18 to 26 year olds want to emigrate out of Russia. You cannot build a country you cannot build a country where 43% of your young people want to emigrate out of the country. So the cost on Russia is going to be probably generational right now, and that's how they'll be held to account, I fear, more than in a, uh, in a courtroom. Which, which doesn't help the Ukrainians in the moment. And uh, Secretary Cohen, let me ask you, the Ukrainians have been begging NATO for a no-fly zone mm -hmm. or for MiGs. And NATO has responded by uh, buttressing the forces outside of Ukraine. How does this help Ukraine, no matter how many troops get pushed into Poland or, or other countries? Well, we are helping the Ukrainians by um, giving them the capability to take out tanks, uh, aircraft, uh, et cetera. The problem with a no-fly zone uh, is that 
you have to establish, you have to go and take out the ground forces. Mm -hmm. The ones that are on the ground uh, that can take your planes out. You put your planes over the, okay. We can go air to air, that's, uh, General Mattis can uh, you know, go into that in detail. But then in order to really have a no-fly zone, you have to go after the ground forces as well. President Biden has said that he will not uh, start World War III by going after um, Putin in Ukraine. <clears throat> I don't think it's wise as a general policy to tell somebody what you won't do. Uh, I think it's better to have him guess what you will or won't do. There was a debate, so I, I think as far as a no-fly zone, you have to have a, also a no-drive zone. Uh, as well. So the question is, will, will you uh, run the risk of going to war with Putin? Now, some would say it's not that much of a risk because Putin is not, I think, as General Mattis has said, he's not insane. He's not, he's not suicidal. Uh, you don't know that in terms of what he's capable of, but nonetheless, the CIA and others who have made this analysis have said it's not worth the risk in terms of the reward uh, of uh, putting more planes in the air to take out uh, his um, uh, aircraft. Uh, I've come more uh, to the judgment over the last few weeks that I think that we ought to give uh, the Ukrainians more aircraft uh, that are now based in Poland uh, to give, if not the military uh, need, the psychological <clears throat> need for President uh, Zelensky to say thank you, uh, and I feel better now, we're gonna take them on. I think the morale needs a pickup as well. And as you were asking uh, uh, Colonel, uh, uh, Corporal uh, Carpenter here um, about morale. Uh, the morale of the Ukrainians is high. The morale of the Russians is low. But I think the Ukrainians need a boost as well to say, the United States and the West is really with them. They've given us these planes. They're not, they're not U.S. planes. They're basically Polish uh, planes, and we know how to fly them. Uh, and uh, I don't know that it would make that much of a military difference, but I think in terms of morale, in terms of telling Putin, you can't dictate all of the terms. You started a war, and you're telling us what we can do, what equipment we can give. Um, uh, that's not the way it should work. So I think that we tell him less about what we won't do and provide more of what we can do uh, without, quote, crossing the line and going to a full-scale war with Russia. It might come to that mm -hmm. uh, if he were to touch any part of uh, the uh, NATO um, uh, countries. Uh, then I think all bets are off. And I don't think he wants to have all bets off. Uh, so I, I think we ought to do more for the Ukrainians. <clears throat> Seeing what shape the Russian military is in, but also understanding it is a vast country and he can get more soldiers and more equipment. Mm -hmm. Is it a risk to take him on directly? Do you think he would use nuclear weapons? Well, as, as Ukraine becomes more and more of a bleeding ulcer for him, uh, I think Secretary Austin put it very well, Secretary of Defense Austin, when he said that he can always draw more troops, as you point out, from elsewhere and send them in. But he's going to be sending them in to a wood chipper, is the way he described it, if we provide the Ukrainians the ability to fight. Strategically, uh, we are in a tough position, and it, it's morally offensive, repugnant, and insult to us to watch what's happening to the Ukrainian people. But right now, President Biden, I believe, must uh, do everything he can to keep this war from spreading. Uh, if it spreads, that's not good for Ukraine either, because now Ukraine becomes a bit player to a broader war. So to keep this war from spreading is critical right now, and we mustn't do things as much as we want to do everything possible to help the Ukraine people. That's going to thrust this into a NATO versus Russia act of operation. If that happens, and looking at the pathetic performance of this Russian army, he could very easily be pushed toward a nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and while you would say, well, that's not rational, this is a creature straight out of Dostoevsky. He sees Russia surrounded by nightmares. And he, wants to, he only sees two kind of states around him. One is a vassal, does exactly what they're told when he tells them to do it, think Belarus. Mm -hmm. And one is Czechoslovakia, an imperfect, struggling democracy where people have freedom of speech, freedom of press, things we take for granted we should never.
take for granted. And if he leaves that where it's at right now, he's going to be threatened. So we're in a very, very difficult position. We don't want this to spread more widely. And we do need to do, I think, exactly what Secretary Cohen said, which is give all possible means to the Ukrainian people, support them diplomatically, support the refugees. And, and just think of this. He, Putin has basically declared war on a country the size of France. Uh, statewide, it'd be like if you took all of Texas except the panhandle. <clears throat> and he has sent in, initially, 100,000 troops. He has suffered enormous casualties and equipment loss. How is he going to subdue a country still with some 40 million people in it, nearly the size of Texas, with fewer troops than Texas probably has in terms of Texas Rangers, Highway Patrol, and local police? I mean, it, it, this is going to be a disaster for him. So now what we have to do is try to stop the disaster from actually mushrooming, literally into a mushroom cloud, I would say. If he were to use strategic nuclear weapon in Ukraine, which is not a member <clears throat> of NATO, what happens then? Well, I, I, that I would not speculate on. I will tell Good you answer. that during my, <laughs> well, uh, during my time as Secretary of Defense, uh, our spies are very, very good. They were good then. And they revealed to us that he had a policy of what's called escalate to de-escalate. Remember those three words. Escalate a conventional war to a low-yield nuclear weapon, and then say, now we will de-escalate. Don't touch me now. And we will stop where we're at. In other words, he escalates to victory. <clears throat> our response was, with good consultation with our European allies, by the way, was to establish both an air-launched and sea-launched cruise missile once more with a low-yield weapon, and also to, uh, to put those weapons on board the submarines, which are very hard for the Russians to know where they're at. The idea was, and I told my Russian counterpart through channels, not personally, that we've read your mail, don't even think about it. This is a nuclear deterrent. This is not for nuclear war fighting. So we have done what we can to try to keep the peace one more year, one more month, one more week as our diplomats try to solve this issue. But eventually we're going to have to deal with a guy who's pretty, uh, pretty mercurial and he's very much a, uh, a risk taker. I'm going to have one more question on Ukraine because I could talk to you all for five hours on this, but I, I want to hit a couple more subjects. But Kyle, I'm going to give you a final question. Um, the title of your book is You Are Worth It, Building a Life Worth Fighting For. And that refers to your belief that people in this country, people you've never met, people you don't know, our families, our government, are worth sacrificing for. Is this belief necessary among all military men and women in order to put their lives on the line? And I ask that in the context of you, Ukrainian military versus <clears throat> Russian military and what each is fighting for. I would say that it's not only true, but it's a prerequisite for those that serve that are willing to, like many in here, give up to their lives for each other, for their nations, and for something greater uh, than themselves. And uh, you said uh, our nation and, and um, our troops. But when it comes to service, uh, you are worth it applies just as much to everyone around the world who wakes up every day hoping that today's sunrise is a little more hopeful and a little less fearful than the days before. Um, 
when I say you are worth it, I think of many things, but, um, you know, it, it applies to the children who, in Afghanistan and so many places around the world, they just want to experience what is school like. They want to have shoes on their feet as they walk miles and 100 degree plus temperatures down rocky roads with an old gas can that they're going to use to get unsanitary drinking water out of a community well. It applies to the women who just want to wake up and feel like they're being given their God-given dignity that we all and all women deserve. The children that at 12 years old came to us crying telling us that they're the ones that threw the grenade over our wall because the Taliban pulled them out of bed in the middle of the night and put a live grenade in their hand and forced them to make a decision to throw the grenade or to cease to exist. The children that asked me through interpreters is everywhere in America like Disney World. So that's why I say you are worth it, to let all of you know, all Americans know, and the people around the world that just hope for a better life for themselves and their families, that you are worth it, and you are worth serving and sacrificing for, and three years in a hospital bed and deep scars on our bodies, limbs that so many who I recovered with will live without forever, those that somehow, along with incredible military medicine and loving and caring corpsmen and devoted medics, survived the battlefield as quadruple amputees who when I would open my door to go to therapy every morning, they would have their small children on what's left of their legs pushing their electric chairs with what's left of their arms with a smile on their face, pushing forward to therapy and to make themselves better and to rebuild their lives and what's left of their body. But I also say that to put it back on those that thank me for my service, to put it back on all of you. To let you hear that and think, you know, I am worth it. I am worth all of that. I am worth waking up in this amazing country that those in World War II at 17, 18, 19 years old, knew that they most likely were not going to make it out of the landing craft. But when they landed on the beach and that door opened up, they charged for it anyway. Those that knew they were bleeding out after covering grenades for their fellow Marines and troops in Vietnam, knowing in the last few seconds and breaths of their full measure of devotion that they were giving that most would not understand or even know where or how they gave that last full measure of devotion. Those that froze fighting at the Chosen Reservoir in Korea, those that not only never made it home, 
those that are still guarded today in Arlington at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers, we still, generations later, cannot accurately tell their families how or where. You know, they gave it all for each other and their country. So, um, you know, I challenge you, like I said earlier, to uh, the ROTC troops. Life is worth everything you've got. And they weren't scary because we were in Afghanistan for a noble cause, but I tasted those final moments and the darkness closed in. I thought about my family. I said a quick prayer for forgiveness for anything I had done wrong. And at 21 years old, as my ears are ringing right now as I talk to you on this stage, that was it. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We're all destined for those final moments, and I hope they're all at the end of a long and happy life, fulfilling life for all of you, a life that you've been able to live and pursue happiness because of a free country. But they will come. And so make the most of it. Because again, it's worth everything we've got. And um, all we can do is be there for each other and be on this journey together. Work hard, try to be good people and do good things and uh, ultimately leave the world uh, better than when you came into it and uh, the time that you were here. Thank you, Kyle. Secretary Cohen, I'm <clears throat> sorry to make you follow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I already promoted him to colonel a you moment did. ago. Okay. So I, I'll take it. <laughs> he has that power. Um, I want to turn, if we can, to Yemen, where another human crisis is unfolding. The <clears throat> United Nations says that the civil war in Yemen has produced the largest humanitarian crisis in the world, with 24 million people, that's 80% of the population, needing humanitarian protection. There is hunger, there is actual famine, there are 10,000 children known to have been killed or wounded. Saudi Arabia is a U.S. ally. <clears throat> Saudi Arabia has spent seven years in this conflict fighting the Houthi rebels, mm -hmm. and the U.S. supports Saudi Arabia's involvement. The U.S. also sells weapons to the Saudis. Now, the U.S. may not have a leadership role in this conflict, but we do have a role. A two-month ceasefire has been announced uh, with, a, with uh, the advent of Ramadan. But Secretary Cohen, given the Saudi crime, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's role in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and that the Houthis in Yemen have actively fought against Al-Qaeda and against ISIL, is the United States on the right side of this conflict? I don't think there's a right <clears throat> side of, of this conflict. Um, we don't get to choose um, our allies or partners uh, all the time, and this is a situation in which there's a real conflict. Uh, I met with uh, MBS, or, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, shortly after the, uh, the war began, and I was assured that it would only last another three weeks. Uh, well, <laughs> years later, they're still at it. Uh, we, um, we're, uh, we were concerned for the kind of weapons they were using, uh, the fact that they were targeting civilian uh, areas. And so uh, we uh, cut back, actually, on the support that we were giving them. Uh, and then we were confining it more to intelligence so that you'll know where your adversaries are, but giving them good intelligence so that they could go after the people that they were trying to hit, and not civilians. Part of the problem is that uh, Saudis are not doing this on their own. Iran has a big role in this. Iran is using the Houthis uh, and the Yemenis as a proxy war against the Saudis. So we are not 
friendly with the Iranians. We see Iran as an enemy uh, in the region uh, and don't want to do anything. I don't know. That's not an incoming. I, I was no. just going to say, I don't, I don't know if we're supposed to duck and cover or... Uh, okay. <laughs> so we're in a situation in which we don't want to help the Iranians. The Iranians actually are using the Houthis to target the Saudis. Uh, the Saudis, for whatever reason, they still are one of the major suppliers of oil and gas to the world economy. Not that we're acquiring so much uh, from the Saudis uh, any longer but the Saudis are important for world economic stability. So do we want to have the Iranians be able to target the oil pipelines uh, of the Saudis without them being able to defend? So you have these other issues which you have to contend with. Um, so what we try and do, and by the way, here's a different dimension of this problem. The reason that the Saudis are unsure of the US commitment is that they can say to us that, you know, if, we don't, if you don't give us what we need, we can get it elsewhere. Who would give it to them from another source? The Russians. Russia. And so we have a situation in which one, at one point the Saudis and the others in the Middle East could count on the United States to help <clears throat> defend their interests. And we're saying, well, maybe we shouldn't be involved with the Saudis. Maybe we should cut back. Maybe we won't give them what they're looking for in the way of an arms package which is being held up uh, in the Senate. Uh, then they can go to Putin, and he's more than happy. Putin is more than happy to come and be the defender of the Saudi regime, more than happy uh, to play a role now in Syria, mm -hmm. more than happy to be the dominant supplier of weapons throughout the, the entire Middle East. So we're caught in a situation in which, do we want that to happen, <clears throat> where we can exercise some uh, constraint upon what the Saudis and the others are doing in order to uh, make sure that there's not greater instability in the Middle East. So it's not an easy choice. You have to go through and say, okay, we don't like what's happened, and we don't like the way you're pursuing this war, but let's look at the option. If Putin were there being able to do what he's doing in Ukraine in terms of doing the same thing as, he's doing, as he did in Syria, would that spread to the other areas, including the Saudis and possibly UAE uh, and, and others? So those are the kind of hard decisions that any administration has to make. And it may offend our sensibilities that we're dealing with countries that don't share our uh, standards, but they, they have an impact on the world economy. And the one thing we are eager to avoid is taking action which allows another country to exert authority and do it in a way that's adverse to our, our own and to international security <clears throat> interests. So they're not easy calls. Uh, we have to try and say, and I think we have urged the Saudis to be more restrained, to not uh, use dumb uh, bombs, so to speak, to use precision munitions, have good intelligence, and be uh, concerned that the United States is still very much concerned about human rights and uh, not targeting and, and, and killing uh, innocent civilians. But not an easy case to resolve, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that they've decided to cease um, the, the war for two months. Maybe something will come out of that, and if so, it'll be a good thing. Well, speaking of, of situations that are uh, unwinding in a way that we don't like, um, I'd like to talk for a moment about Afghanistan, which is another huge um, humanitarian crisis. Nearly 25 million people are requiring humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan right now. Half the population faces hunger. Um, nine million people currently in a state of food insecurity, and that, according to the UN, is the highest in the world. So, General Mattis, how much of this ongoing tragedy in Afghanistan now is the result of the U.S. withdrawal? Well, it's impossible to say that our withdrawal uh, didn't have a significant impact here. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the American surrender, uh, such as it was, uh, especially without consultation with allies, uh, put the allies in a hurried up mode to get their troops out, this sort of thing. And if you look back a, a year ago, we didn't have 24 million people, according to the United Nations now, 
in urgent need of humanitarian support. If you go back a year ago, <clears throat> Afghan girls made up over 40% of the population of the high school students. As of this morning, they make up 0%. So if you've ever wondered who's the good guys and who's the bad guys in the world, this should help clarify your discrimination. I think that, uh, yes, at times we've, we've gotten it wrong in America, but we have a unique ability to learn from our mistakes and look at the way Bill Burns and Secretary of State Blinken, the director of CIA and Blinken, are now consulting with allies, sharing intelligence. We can learn from our mistakes. We should, be, we should acknowledge we made a mistake and there are severe humanitarian results of strategic mistakes. It's why Secretary Cohen just said when you're at this level and he's been at the apex of government, you generally at that level get the choice between two bad options. Mm -hmm. And whether it be in Yemen, where we're, you know, not one of those missiles being fired by the Houthis is made in Yemen. They're all coming, the dozens, the hundreds mm -hmm. that are being fired on the United Arab Emirates and on Saudi, on civilian towns are being made in Iran. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to do what is necessary and not what you want to do. I'm quite certain that FDR did not find a lot in common with Joseph Stalin when he made common cause to defeat Hitler. Once in a while, we need to give our presidents, I don't care what party, this isn't a partisan statement, we need to give them a little leeway, a little respect that they're trying to do what is right in a world that gives them only the choice between bad options. And this is a, a case where we made a choice that probably strategically was not as sound or as, as much the result of consultation with our allies as it should have received. Mm -hmm. Can I add a postscript to what uh, the general had just said? Um, when he was serving as Secretary of Defense, uh, I made a policy not to call him. Uh, that uh, he was occupying that office and he didn't need my advice on anything. So we kept uh, uh, a separation of church and state, so to speak. Uh, uh, I didn't want to in any way uh, call and ask what he was doing or give him any advice because I knew he knew, what, knew more than I did. But I was sitting doing an interview with BBC, and Caddy Kay, if you remember when she was doing BBC, I was sitting in front of her, and she uh, was sitting right there, and just as the cameras were coming on and they're counting down 10, 9, 8, she slipped me a piece of paper and said, we have just heard that President uh, Trump uh, has uh, ordered the removal of our, all American forces. And now, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> and so I uh, kind of babbled for the next couple of minutes and got my way through it. And the minute I got off, I called uh, Secretary Mattis. I said, tell me what's going on. And uh, he said, well, we've been ordered to take our troops out. And I said, how this soon? This Syria, right, sir? Syria, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Syria. And I said, uh, how soon? He said, immediately. And I knew at that moment what was going to take place. I didn't talk to him after that. The next day... Uh, he, uh, he, well, he typed up a little um, a letter of resignation, and he went in to see President Trump and asked him to consider at least having time to consult with our allies, at least having time to do it over a period of time so there could be order out of chaos. And uh, he went in to see the president. The president said, no, do it now. Uh, at that moment, um, General Mattis, and being the man that he is, said, uh, I no longer can serve you. Here's my resignation, because we no longer share the same worldview about the need for um, principle, for dealing with our allies, for protecting our troops who will be endangered by this. And so there are times when you have to give your president leeway in dealing with bad situations, and there are times what General Mattis did, Secretary Mattis did, in saying, I can't, um, I can't support serving in this capacity as high an honor as it is, uh, I have my own sense of honor and duty, and I resign. So I, I, I wanted to say that because he doesn't talk about it, and I think it's important that people understand it. Gentlemen, we have just a, a couple more minutes, mm -hmm. and before we uh, close, I'd like to talk for a moment about China. Okay. Uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping's no limit strategic alliance with Vladimir Putin has kept him from denouncing Putin's war in Ukraine. 
Now this weekend there was a virtual summit between Xi and EU leaders, and he warned the EU leaders that they should not tie the war in Ukraine to the entire world. And in his view, this would um, upset several decades of world cooperation. EU leaders, however, said that he must not interfere with these sanctions. Is Xi really under any pressure here? I'll, I'll start with you, Secretary. Oh, I think he is under pressure. Mm -hmm. I think if he were to have no limits uh, to his cooperation with Russia, if he were to provide either military equipment uh, or uh, uh, financial support to keep the war going, that he would see sanctions imposed on uh, China. So I don't think that he has uh, a, a limitless ability to, uh, to work with uh, the Russians. But I come back to the point as far as uh, Xi is concerned. He really is convinced that we are on the decline and China's on the rise, on the ascendancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has made this deal with uh, the Russians. They've been getting closer and closer together as such. Uh, Russia gives him uh, uh, energy, weapons that uh, he may have. Uh, and um, they believe that that is the, the, the wave of the future. Uh, dictatorial or authoritarian governments versus democracies. So that is what they are betting, and that's why it's so important what the EU is doing. With the EU, EU standing as strong as they are in supporting Ukraine now, it's also sending a message uh, to, uh, to China. If you are thinking about using force against Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see a reaction. You may see a reaction similar to what you're seeing now in Ukraine. So it's a little um, reminder that democracy still can get together. We believe, as Colonel Carpenter has said uh, today, and I, I'd make him uh, a one star at least after uh, today's <laughs> reform, uh, that uh, we believe <clears throat> that freedom uh, is the essential uh, core of the human existence, that people who are free to make decisions, uh, to um, pool their talent and resources together, without the government dictating everything they should say and do and think. And we have to be concerned. It's happening a little bit in this country, but in China now, it's pretty Orwellian uh, in terms of the total government control uh, over the ability of uh, the people to say things. Uh, it's only happened in the last few years because I have found, I have spent a lot of time in China. Uh, I have uh, offices in, uh, in China. Uh, and I have been going there since 1978. Uh, and so I, I feel that the Chinese people uh, understand me and they have been very open to me uh, to the point where uh, I can say anything I can say to you in this uh, auditorium, I can say to them, uh, either in an open um, forum or privately, which is the best way to deal with the Chinese or any country, is to sit down behind closed doors and say, here are the problems we have with what you're saying or doing. And I have found them to be receptive up until 2008. Mm -hmm. And it started to change in 2008 with the financial crisis we had here. Second thing is they looked at what we did in going into Iraq and they said, big mistake. Number one, you went in. Number two, uh, you weren't successful. You're still there. And then number th when the uh, financial crisis hit, they started to think, well, we're not so sure the United States uh, is really all of that strong. Uh, you're supposed to be the wizards of Wall Street. It doesn't look too good with all those financial instruments you're able to create. And so they started to look at the West and say, the future is not lying with democracy, but with um, autocracy or Chinese rule. Um, it, it's a good reminder for uh, the Chinese to say, look what the, uh, the West can do when they see something as outrageous as this taking place. So I think uh, China, believe it, I mean, they are going to be an adversary, or I say a competitor. We don't have to make them an enemy. Uh, they're going to be a competitor. And what I've said to the Chinese, look, you think we're trying to uh, contain you. We can't. You're too big. We can't contain you. But what we can do as free countries and democracies, we can help restrain you from using this growing military power, this economic power that you have. We can restrain that by us joining together. And that's why you saw the Quad. And that is where the United States, uh, and now we have India, Japan, and Australia. It's an economic agreement, but now these four great countries are working together on the economic level to show you that we have power, economic power, that can help 
offset your growing economic behemoth. Uh, and so we're trying to restrain you in a way that allows you to be as, as strong as you want to be, provided you don't use that strength in a way that is, upsets and interrupts international peace and stability. So that is our goal in dealing with China. So there's one way to, to deal with someone who's a competitor. You can try and hold them back, which we might try and do with China, which I don't think is a good way, or you can run faster. We have to run faster than our competitor. That means we have to invest in all the things that they are investing in. They picked out 10 silos as such, 10 verticals of saying, we want to be number one in supercomputing. Uh, we want to be number one in electrical vehicles. We want to be number one in cyber technology. We're going to put all of our resources in all of these things. And that's what they're going to do. So they, they're, they're ready to compete. Now, we can try to hold them back and interrupt it. But the better answer is we can run faster than you can. We can be more innovative than you can. We're the ones who have the flexibility to adapt, and that is survival. That's what the Marines are able to do. They're adaptive. They can move and be free and flexible rather than just present a solid phalanx and say, we're coming up against you man to man. It says, no, Marines are going to be flexible. They're going to be warriors capable of taking the battle to you, but they can move and adapt. And that's the genius of our system. And that's why we have to run faster than the Chinese are able to do to show them that we'll compete with you, but we're not going to allow you to dictate the terms of what that uh, order is going to be. So that's why we have the Quad. That's why we have our, all of our allies. That's why it's so important to have the EU, have NATO, to have other countries as far as Singapore joining and supporting what we're, we're doing now with Ukraine. And, um, and so that's the battle of the future. And so it really comes back to what we were talking about before. Will the United States stay the course? Will, as Jim Mattis used to say, Secretary Mattis, will our troops hold the line? Will we be true to the values that we profess to cherish most but don't often practice? We've got to get back to the core values of why we are the great country we are. What is it that made us strong? It comes back to ethical values, moral principles, strength, and a commitment to compete on a level playing field. If that's the, uh, the deal, uh, we can win. Thank you, Secretary mm -hmm. Paul. <clears throat> I'm going to sign up again. I've, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it one more time. You really need to do a TED Talk, OK? <laughs> we want a TED Talk. Okay. Uh, this concludes the 13th Cohen Lecture here at the University of Maine. I want to thank you all for coming and thank the University of Maine. And once again, please thank Medal of Honor winner Kyle Carpenter. <laughs> Former Secretary of Defense and General Jim Mattis. Thank you. And our lecture namesake, son of Maine, Secretary William right. Cullen. <laughs> and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.